So thanks, Marco. It was pretty clear. And uh, considering that we are winemakers, uh, we will start with marketing considerations. <laughs> because uh, at the end, uh, as I wrote on the slide, uh, we needed to sell all of our bottles because we make wines for ourselves. Uh, when the wines has to be good, uh, but uh, we are still making the wines for the market. So we have to remember and plan our production, thinking that we are in a business. I wrote four points. It's a fact that the average quality of the wine increased dramatically worldwide in the last 10 years, and this is true worldwide, not only in Friuli, luckily. It's a fact that the international taste changed the customer palate, and that's a pity. It's also a fact that the demand for territorial and autochthonal wines is increasing, especially in our area, where we have something like 1,000 autochthonal varietals, and it is said that in Italy we have more than 1,000 autochthonal varietals. Also, and that's the sub point, the quality of a wine is also defined by the brand's fame. Let's see one of each point. A lot of research has been done on viticulture and winemaking, and all the results have been published and made available on the internet. It's a fact that you can Google about uh, winemaking and find uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages where winemakers, uh, scientists, and so on, put their results available for everyone. Now, operations and interventions made on wine are made consciously. In the last years, where they were just considered traditional. People, winemakers, really did not understand what was happening in the tank. Now, what we do in the wine is done because we know from a scientific point of view what we are doing. Also, new technologies and new products can help us in reaching desired results. And most important, there is a big competition worldwide because wine lovers have now the opportunity to buy wine from all over the world. And uh, consumers make comparisons. They compare quality, price, brand, and at the end, they decide. At the end, poor wines have less opportunities on the market. Let's talk about international taste. When wine, when wine was sold locally, and now I'm talking mainly about Friuli, People knew the characteristic of specific local varietals, and being used to them, these characteristics were appreciated. I will make an example about a Friulian variety whose name is Tazzelenge, literally, literally means tongue cutter. This is because of, of its uh, tannins and its, uh, its very high acidity. Friulian people usually drink this wine in the winter, pairing it with game. It's a perfect match. But uh, I found very difficult to talk about Tazzelenge here in the United States, because uh, you prefer Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, usually very soft. So trying to make uh, American people conscious about the potential, the aging potential, and the quality of sale of, of Tazzelenge is really very hard. What happened, in my opinion, is that having hundreds of different wines to taste, the main characteristics of a wine become the parameters. For example, for a red wine, more color means better quality. More body means better quality. More nose means better quality. And, and that's sad, more sugar means better quality. There are many, dif it's a fact, there are many differences in wines. Let's, let's think at French Pinot Noir, for example. From an international point of view, it can, it can be considered a great wine, but we know that it's an incredible wine. The diffusion of the international taste led to a simplification of the idea of quality, and that's the sad part. But I believe that also approached more people to wine. What's happening now is that new consumers, after improving their tasting skills, are now requesting new wines. This is a great challenge for wineries, as they have the opportunity to offer to their customers something different, regional, and this is very important, not yet standardized. And at the end, we have a brand's fame. I wrote that it's easier for a famous winery to have a good score or award on a very good wine than for a small, unknown one to have the same result for a mixed, excellent wine. And this shifts our attention to the most important thing for a winery, that is communication. From what I've seen here, you have a good marketing of uh, your products. Your, uh, every winery has a testing room, a very nice testing room, uh, gentle people approaching the customer. You communicate very well, but the communication is not just made locally. You should fill your testing room with journalists from all around the world. You should arrange uh, tastings all around the world because the competition is worldwide. Is worldwide. It's a fact that the most important wineries tried to sell their wines in the most important markets in all the world because this means that the wine will be visible. <coughs> 
So we come now to production planning. Considering uh, all these things and summing, summing uh, all it up, I think that the wines must be well aimed to be promoted and sold. We have here the wines you can do in Water War. Here we have the wines you will sell, and that's about marketing. As you can see, there are wines that you can make on your terroir that will not be easily uh, accepted by the market. And also, there are wines that the market will receive uh, quite easily that it's impossible to make on your terroir. A most important thing, the wines you like. It's the fact that when you speak about your wines, you have to be convinced that they are good. So it's, it's impossible for an for a honest winemaker to lie. So you, have to this, you, you must make wines that you can defend in every condition. So where all these circles meet, we have the wines to make. This is production planning. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about terroir. That is the most used word by winemakers, sales managers, journalists, and so on, because it has glamour to the bottle, reminding to tradition, historicity, and so on. I believe that sometimes this word is also used to justify imperfect wines. Usually this word is used as a synonymous of soil. But the terroir has been properly defined many years ago by the famous French journalist, um, sorry, enologist Emile Peinot, as the sum of soil, climatic condition, and man. So, according to this definition, terroir it is not just a collection of minerals in the soil, but a complex combination of elements that changes every year, and where the winemaker has the opportunity to add a personal touch. Understanding your terroir is not an easy task. Surely you know that there are some basic rules. For example, it's impossible to harvest a ripe Cabernet Sauvignon in a very cold area. It's impossible to have a good nose in a Sauvignon Blanc planted in an arid or dry land. But there are two things that I, can, I think can help in understanding what to plant and how to manage the vineyards, and are history, meaning with these wines already and successfully made on your land. The most important Friulian red varietal, Pignolo, was extincted and it was discovered again thanks to some old Friulian books. And also experimentation. Friulian winemakers, starting nearly 30 years ago, planted everything everywhere on every possible kind of soil. As you have seen from this point of view, Friuli is a good land as we have very different conditions in a very small surface. This slide is just about experimentation. It's a collection of photos I shot two weeks ago in a vineyard I own. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, and we are uh, using different training system just to understand which is the best training system for this varietal on this land. I can say that after 10 years, I understood nothing. Because it seems that, for example, Guyot is uh, the best if you want to, to have a, how can I say it? Guyot is uh, not responding to different vintages. In other words, Guyot is always uh, very good. But from some point of view, the cordon seems to be better in excellent vintages, but seems to be very poor in bad vintages. So at the end, I think that you should, we should continue experimentation trying to understand more. I will make some basic uh, considerations about viticulture, even if I am not an agronomist, but I think we can say something. The first and most important thing is that good bunches come from good terroirs. It's not so stupid as it seems. <laughs> then, good bunches are perfectly ripe bunches. Underripe fruit is always a problem. Sugar and acidity can be easily corrected. But usually, every intervention push away the wine from a perfect balance between all the compounds, leading to a less elegant wine. In other words, we can use reverse osmosis, we can do a lot of things on wine, but when we have a perfectly, perfectly ripe bunches, that's the perfect condition to make great wines. Also, underripe tannins are harsh and very difficult to manage, and usually never lead to an excellent wine. Also, underripe fruit is poor in aromatic compounds, leading, and this is most important, leading to a wine with poor personality. We know that there are several kinds of training systems, and we also know that none of them is perfect. Different terroirs, different varietals require different training systems and different interventions. 
For instance, uh, the foliation during ripening is great for uh, nearly all the varietals, but it's very harmful for the aromas of Sauvignon Blanc. I've seen here that you defoliate everything. I do the same in a winery, but uh, coming to Sauvignon Blanc and to Traminer, I leave all the leaves uh, in uh, their place uh, to protect uh, the grapes from uh, direct uh, sunlight exposure. And I've seen from my experience that this tends to burn the fresh aromas of the Sauvignon Blanc. Also, plantation density is very important. It is believed that 1.3 square meters, it should be something like 14 square feet of exposed leaves, is required to bring to perfect ripeness one kilo of fruit. There's also a limit in the capacity of a single plant to produce roots. Summing everything up, we can say that the correct production for a single plant is between 0.5 kilos to 3 kilos of fruit per single plant. From my experience, uh, producing less than this uh, will lead to no significant changes in the composition of the mast, uh, but it's a fact that the more we produce, uh, the worse will be the quality. I showed this couple of photos uh, just to compare the ratio between leaves uh, per hectare in a very high density vineyard and in a low density vineyard. Both of these vineyards are mine, uh, and I have to plant uh, the, the second photo I have to, plow, to plant with the low density just because we are on a very ripid, can I say ripid? It's, a, no, it's, on, a, it's on the hill slope and uh, it was impossible to have high density vineyards here, so the distance between the two lines is nearly two meters. But from these two photos, you immediately understand that we have more solar, solar panel where we have high density vineyards than in the other case. And uh, the leaf is the solar panel of the plant. Uh, it's uh, the system that the plant uses to bring energy into itself and it's the only way to have uh, good branches. I'll make a simple example about plantation density. Let's say that we have two different vineyards, one with 2,000 plants on one hectare and the other one with 8,000 plants on the same surface. Let's talk about the first one with the 2,000 plants on one hectare. We want to produce uh, 12 tons, this is just to give a number. So we will have to produce six kilos of fruit per single plant. In Friuli, it is believed that this will lead to a very poor average quality. On the other side, on the same hectare, we planted 8,000 plants. We want the same production, 12 tons. So the production per plant will be 1.5 kilos per plant and from what I've seen, the average quality will be very, very good. If you want, we can make extreme examples. We can say, for example, that producing uh, 0 0.8 kilos of fruit per plant on 8,000 plants per hectare vineyard, we will produce only 8.6 tons of fruit per hectare. And I'm sorry, but in Europe we talk about uh, hectares instead acres, and uh, this can be confusing. I, I, I hope you understand. Uh, the quality of this extreme example will be outstanding. And uh, there are also other great advantages in high density vineyards. And the most important for me is that the roots, being very near, tend to compete for the water. This moves them much deeper than low density vineyards into the soil, reaching layers poorer in nutrient but much richer in minerals and uh, salts. This gives uh, wines with much more personality. It seems that uh, with this kind of plantation, you bring the soul of the terroir into the grapes. Of course, there's one big disadvantage. More plants need more labor, and this means that uh, high-density vineyards are more expensive than the low-density ones, but quality is never for free. Another very important thing in managing uh, vineyards is uh, water. It's a kind of stress control you can use. Uh, there are several limiting factors affecting the behavior of, of the plant, but for sure, water is the most important one. I've seen that a lack of water during ripening can lead to a delay and in some cases to a complete stop of the process itself. This, this is especially true for the red varietals. A lack in water usually means uh, harsh tannins, even if during a uh, ripening time you have very sunny conditions. It seems that if the plant stops uh, just for a couple of days, uh, then ripening, especially with the tannins, will be stopped. This, this is what usually happens in Friuli. So this is why in Friuli we're experimenting several different of irrigation uh, systems. And uh, mainly we are experimenting with the three types. Uh, and uh, all of them have uh, benefits and disadvantages. 
in the last years, the most uh, popular was buried irrigation system that uh, gives a better control as usage uh, of water, but it is very expensive and uh, unmovable. And the big problem is that if damaged, fixing them, fixing it's, uh, it's extremely expensive. Uh, another system are pierced tubes between the vine and the soil. I, I, I know that uh, you are correctly using this, uh, but I'm trying to give our fueling experience, so <laughs> forgive me for saying uh, something that you already know. <laughs> Uh, this kind of system requires more water as a part of it uh, is uh, evaporated, but it's less expensive to inspect and fix in case of damage. What is uh, interesting is that the irrigation system simulating rain that is mainly based on movable coils uh, that was used on other kind of uh, cultivations in Friuli is becoming more popular because it's a fact that a great part of the water is lost, uh, partly because uh, evaporation and partly because it simply runs away. But uh, this system is becoming popular again, as it seems that when you give water simulating a rain, the temperature around the leaves is reduced, and this opens the leaves stoma, helping to increase the leaf activity. This is very important, especially when, we, when it comes to that kind of stop we were talking before. We have seen that uh, when the, the leaves starts to uh, become uh, soft and tends to, mm, to move, to be not so rigid and strong, giving water in this moment is very helpful in keeping the, the, the ripening process still active. When to give water is still uncertain, and uh, when the leaves are already weak and fold, it, that's usually too late. I think that a good agronomist should control daily the vineyard, understanding possible water stress before it's obvious. Stupid photo. <laughs> It's the fact that before harvesting, a good practice is uh, to thin. Reducing the weight of the fruit of the plant, adapting it to the potential of the plant is very important. But what I think is essential is to understand that there are no given rules and that mainly every plant is a single individual and requires a specific treatment. This means that uh, we can talk about fixed rules. We can't say that uh, eight uh, bunches per plant is too much or six plants, six bunches per plant is enough. It is, it is entirely related to the behavior of the single plant. Of course, these operations are to be done by very, very well-trained people, because it's probably the most important thing we can do in the wine, in the vineyard, to focus our attention on quality. Let's talk about checking ripeness. Checking, uh, choosing the right day to harvest is as important as all the rest of the winemaking process uh, summing together. Assuming that uh, you made a good sample, and that's not so easy, representative of the real situation in the vineyard, we usually sample uh, not less than 100 berries from as many plants. We can evaluate uh, ripeness from three different points of view. The traditional technical ripeness that is defined by sugar and titratable acidity, that's an old parameter, but it's still working, especially if expressed as uh, the ratio between sugar and titratable acidity. What is interesting is not the number by itself, but the variation during the ribbing process. Determination of pH, malic and tartaric acid, adds usually useful information. We can then evaluate phenolic ripeness, that is more interesting, but usually more difficult to evaluate, because there are many systems from the old Chloris indexes to much more sophisticated systems and assays. All of them are expensive and time-consuming, but they give you information about the activity of the ripening process. They are mainly important on red varietals as they give information about the degree of polymerization of phenols and consequently the sweetness of the tannins. What is really interesting, and is, it's impossible to do in a winery, is to evaluate the aromatic ripeness. The cost is prohibitive. Uh, one of the problems is that a great part of the aromatic compounds are bound to sugars in the mast, so they need the action of enzymes released by the yeast cells to break the sugar bounds and to be detected. Several studies show that usually the production of aromatic compounds is directly related to the time bunch spends on the plant and the radiation absorbed by the leaves. There are some broken glasses. There are some exceptions, of course. For example, the pyrazines are responsible to Sauvignon Blanc aroma, which tend to reach a peak during technical ripeness and then tend to quickly decrease. 
I took a graph here from a study made from Donato Lannati, uh, a very famous Italian enologist and scientist. He compared the total norisoprenoids that are aromatic compounds partly responsible for the personality of a wine with the same vineyard where he had the sun-exposed berries in the lowest area, sun-exposed berries on the hilltop, sun exposed, no sun exposure in the lowest area, and no sun exposure on the hilltop. With the no sun exposure, uh, we mean uh, uh, foils, um, leaves covering the grapes, the bunches. From what we see, the production of norisoprenoids is directly related to the sun that is absorbed uh, by the bunches, as the, the yellow column, where we have sun-exposed berries on the hilltop, is the higher. And uh, in the lowest area, where we have uh, low radiation and uh, radiation stopped by the leaves, is where we have uh, less norisoprenoids. This means that taking away the leaves uh, allows you to um, produce in the vineyard more of these compounds, giving more personality to the wine. In these slides, we are checking the technical ripeness of a Merlot in a, a very important uh, vineyard in a, for a wine, in a winery where we are consultants. And here you see the evolution of the sugars of titratable acidity and the ratio between sugar and titratable acidity from the 27th of August to the 21 of September, 21st of September. This uh, vineyard was harvested the 22nd of September. Looking at these graphs, uh, it seems uh, that uh, ripeness, uh, ri ripening process is still going on as uh, sugar is increasing, titratable acidity is decreasing, and the ratio between them is still increasing. So, from this point of view, we made a big mistake uh, harvesting this Merlot the 22nd of September because the vineyard was still working for the grapes. But uh, on the same uh, samples, we also uh, studied the, a kind of uh, phenolic uh, um, ripeness. It, it's not a regular system. The extraction was manually crushed berries in uh, ethanol and chlorhydric acid, and some notes about the methods. And we saw that the uh, 11th of September, anthocyanins reached their peak. As you probably know, the synthesis of uh, anthocyanins in the, in the skins reaches a peak, and this can be considered the, the peak of the phenolic ripeness, because after that, the synthesis of these compounds is stopped, and the total color tends to decrease. So from this graph, we understand that the varietal reached, this um, vineyard reached its peak, its uh, phenolic uh, ripeness peak, the 11th of September. So we gave it uh, 10 days of over-ripening uh, on the plant. So probably the 22nd of September was the best possible day to harvest uh, this uh, vineyard. This is just to let you understand that sometimes analysis and uh, lab tests uh, are not so useful as it seems. About checking ripeness, I would spend some word about uh, the berries testing. That is uh, a very interesting thing that some scientists, mainly Donato Lanati and Del Tail, tried to arrange to let you check ripeness of the bunches without such expensive uh, kind of tests. What I usually do in my winery is to sample the bunches check in the lab for technical ripeness, sometimes phenolic ripeness on the most important red varietals, and then I confront this data, the graph of the previous data, with a simple berry test testing to understand my vineyard. How does this work? Uh, you, have a, you need a representative sample of the vineyard, and at this point, if you are the one taking the sample, you can test the berries while sampling. Of course, you need to remember your sensations and uh, probably write them down. Usually I divide the sample in two parts. I put one in the fridge and send the other to the lab for all the analysis I'm uh, asking in that moment. When I have the results, I do this, in, uh, I proceed in the following way. I spread a couple of berries between the fingers and look at the color fixed on the skin. This gives uh, direct information about the color. Then sl slightly choose some berries and uh, try to separate the seeds and the skin with the tongue. Speed the seeds on one end and the skins on the other. The first sensation now is just about sugar and acidity. But after 10 seconds, 
the enzyme as we have in the mouth starts to unbind the aromatic compound from the sugar. So after spitting the must, you will have a, in the aftertaste a very distinct perception of the aromatic potential of the must. This sensation will last just for a few seconds, but it's, uh, I wrote it's not a smelling a glass of wine, but it's a very good system to evaluate, to evaluate aromatic ripeness. After chewing the skins, uh, you have uh, the perception of the tannins in your mouth. Those tannins are the same tannins you will have after a complete uh, maceration process if harvesting now. It's quite simple, but uh, if you chew the skins, you extract, you extract all the tannins, and this will be like a complete maceration. So you can immediately understand if the tannins you are going to have in the winery will be sweet or harsh. For the first time, so I compared this, this sensation with a full phenolic study. I made the glorious indexes just to calibrate the palate. At the end, I spit the skins and uh, look at the color of the seeds. Underripe seeds are green. Perfectly ripe seeds are dark brown. After chewing the seeds, you will have the sensation of uh, coffee for uh, very ripe seeds and the tannic, harsh tannins for uh, underripe seeds. These systems, this system, and that's interesting, is working also for white varietals because perfect ripeness of the skins means more aroma into their cells. And also, when the seeds of a white varietal are brown, you know that there is a little ripening potential left. Let's come to harvest time. And picking the grape is uh, absolutely the best thing you can do. It's the best insurance you can make to preserve the quality accumulated in the vineyard. At this point, I usually operate another selection, deciding to harvest only the perfect bunches. You know that sometimes it's not possible to unharvest. Some examples, several hectares of perfectly ripe fruit and weather forecast tells you that in the next days you will have heavy rain. Or you have several hectares affected by botrytis and it's going to be raining. Or simply you do not have enough people to harvest everything when needed. From what we have seen in these cases, it's better to use mechanical harvest than leaving the fruit in the vineyard. It is still possible to make great quality even with mechanical harvest, as, as I, but as I said, hand picking is always the best. Usually, when we have to do this, we put some dry ice, dry ice into the tanks of the harvester to prevent oxidation. At this point, it's also possible to add ascorbic acid and uh, metabis potassium metabisulfite for white varietals. I've seen that it's very important to harvest slowly, as this allows the machine to eat more lightly the bunches, breaking, breaking less than 20% of the raisins, having less mast in the tanks. Uh, it's very important to keep the wagon you will use to move the pomace to the winery closed with a plastic sheet and fill it with uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah, I, I use dry ice again in this case. And I always add the dry ice every time I add fresh pomace. Then uh, I keep the wagon closed with the sheet and transport the fresh pomace as soon as possible to the winery. When you have the fruit in the cellar, I strongly believe that quality is already fixed. You can do your best to preserve it in your cellar, but you cannot create quality while making wine. The final score is already in the bunch. What can be different is the style, or in other words, the winemaking technique. What uh, I will discuss in the next slides is what we found to be the best system to reach our goals that are elegance, personality, and terroir expression in our lands with our varietals. This is just our Friulian experience. It's not the Bible for a winemaker. There are other goals, other systems to reach them, and none of them better or worse. The style is up to you, and it's just your choice to confront yourself with your land, your varietals, and the market. We'll shortly talk about the white wines. In our winemaking style, reduction is the key. Our goal is not only to prevent oxidation of the mast, but to stop and neutralize the oxidation chain that occurs when you crush the berries. Yeah, that, that would be very interesting, as the wine uh, you will try now is made exactly with this style. So it would so be we're going to pour the Ribola uh, right now and let will keep, keep going. Okay. The wine you will be trying now is uh, exactly made with the style I am describing uh, now. 
Uh, so I was saying that this is why we had dry ice, ascorbic acid and sulfur dioxide starting from the vineyard in case of mechanical harvest and try to transport the fruit into the cellar as fast as possible. Skin contact is also a very important thing for our white varietals because the pulp is mostly water, sugar and acid. The interesting compounds responsible. Hello? Okay. The, com the compounds responsible for quality and personality are in the skin. It's a fact that pressing is a kind of maceration itself, but when you have a perfectly ripe fruit, it's a pity not to extract all the noble molecules from the skin. We have also seen that temperature is essential because enzymes respons responsible for oxidation, mainly tyrosinase and lactase, have an activity peak at 30 degrees Celsius, but stop their activity below 8 Celsius degrees. Also, clearness of the mast is very important to avoid green and grassy aromas. This is a photo of a press we are using in Friuli. It's a um, booker. It's very interesting because uh, it uses carbon dioxide or nitrogen to um, fill the tank every time the um, pomes is pressed. And this gas is, uh, is not lost in the air, but is used to fill a balloon. So the balloon is empty when the press is pressing, and the balloon is full when the press is just rotating to move the pomes. We have seen that using this kind of press, we could obtain, at the end of clarification process, a steel green mast. While with other presses, we had usually oxidative notes from, uh, from yellow mast to dark golden uh, colors. So I'm describing here pressing and clarification of the mast. At the arrival of fruit, that could be bunches or pomes in case of mechanical harvest, with the stem. With the stem even in case of mechanical harvest because the destemming machines mounted on the mechanical harvesters are not so good as the ones we have in the, in the winery. At this point, it is possible to add sulfur dioxide and ascorbic acid to prevent oxidations. It's also possible to add some uh, enzymes to increase the um, efficiency of the skin contact. We spray dry ice in every part of this process. So we, use, uh, uh, we use snow, not pellets, because I found that uh, it evaporates faster and it's more helpful in preventing oxidation and also gives a big, uh, it's very helpful in reducing the temperature of the deep mass. Everything is passed through a cooler, usually they are tubes connected to the refrigerating systems. It's very important the kind of pump used in this process. I use peristaltic pumps because I think that pomas has to be relocated, not crushed in this, uh, in this phase. Usually I proceed to a skin contact from two hours to 24 hours, depending on the varietal, the ripeness, and uh, what, I, what I want from, from that pomas. And everything is put in a previously blanketed with the carbon dioxide tank. This is to have no oxygen uh, during the winemaking process. Uh, at this point, the temperature is uh, 7 Celsius degrees. Uh, 7 because it's uh, 1 degree less than 8. Uh, at, uh, and at, at this temperature, all the um, enzymes responsible for oxidation are completely stopped. After the skin contact, everything is tra transferred into the press, uh, again with the peristaltic pump, and again spraying uh, dry ice uh, everywhere. And uh, usually I press for uh, two hours, uh, sometimes less, because uh, I already had a very good maceration in the tank. Then uh, we clarify the mast. Sometimes we add bentonite, sometimes we add nothing, depending on uh, the kind of mast. And uh, if I add bentonite, I add it at least four hours after pressing began. This is because I want the natural enzymes present in the mast to do their action in uh, clarifying naturally the mast. So we add bentonite just in case of uh, bad, bad clusters, eaten by botrytis and so on. Usually I load the mast to settle for, uh, from one to two days. The limpid is uh, transferred in a previously blanketed tank, again with the carbon dioxide. 
and I try to reach a turbidity from 80 to 120 nephelometric turbidity units. This is what I found to be enough to avoid green aromas and enough to have something still fermentable by the yeasts. At this point, the turbid is filtered with a rotary vacuum filter and uh, I usually add it to the tank because this must is very rich in nutrients and aromatic compounds. Someone could say that uh, you did all your best to prevent oxidation and at the end you put a mast obtained with a rotary vacuum filter in the tank. This is why I usually use this mast to prepare a started with selected yeasts. This is very interesting because you already have oxygen into this mast, so you do not need to add another oxygen. And all the oxidation chains that started will immediately be stopped by fermentation. That will occur very fast as you usually inoculate a lot of yeasts. A very short parenthesis on the yeasts we use. I will say that I usually prefer to add selected strains instead of using natural autochthon yeasts because from my experience, it often happens that uh, when fermented with indigenous flora, the fermentation usually stops before finishing sugars. And I think that it's better to have uh, no residual sugars than having a problem of finishing a fermentation with something that already started add another kind of feast and so on. An, interest, an interesting strategy that I used sometimes could be starting fermentation with the mass own yeasts later adding a selected strain to finish fermentation. This usually adds complexity to the wine. My preferred dosage is uh, 30 grams of uh, dry yeast, yeast per hectoliter that inoculates three millions of active cell per, per milliliter. That is a safe uh, quantity to end fermentation. I've also tried to use smaller quantities and I never had problems. A little selection of yeasts I like, Erchu for aromatic wines, also ALS from Level 9, and also the new strains from Anchor, VIN 7 and VIN 13. For full bodied wines, I usually use the D47 or D254, and uh, sometimes the 71B. For medium bodies, right, I usually use the D18 also, or uh, also NT45 from Anchor. And for full body dress, I love D254 or NT50. Let's come to the fermentation of the white wines. We have the clarified mast at a temperature between 14 and 16 degrees Celsius, and the starter that is kept at a temperature below 20 degrees. These two parts are mixed. And uh, I try to, read, to keep the temperature of 16 degrees until the end of the fermentation. At this point, I add some uh, diammonium phosphate and uh, some complex nutrient that usually is dried yeast e extract. And uh, there is no pumping over. The two things are mixed just with a stirrer and there is no oxygen addition. From what you have seen, uh, adding oxygen at the end of the, at the beginning of the fermentation usually moves to an incomplete fermentation. I usually try to add uh, oxygen the third day. Yeah, 20, minutes. 20 minutes left only? Yeah. Okay, I'll be very short. Okay, second day, no operations. <laughs> <laughs> the third day is uh, when we start adding oxygen with a pumping over and a splash. We pump over 20 minutes for 50 hectoliters. The third day, we add again uh, the ammonium phosphate, and we add again a complex nutrient, and we again make a pumping over with the oxygen. At this point, we have the opportunity to pump the mast in barrels or to continue the fermentation in stainless steel. This is a question on a matter of style. Uh, from the fourth day, we do no operation. We just monitor sugar, stratal acidity, and sometimes pH and volatile acidity, just to check that everything is okay. When we have no sugar left, we refrigerate and keep to six degrees Celsius for four days without sulfur dioxide. Only at this point, we add sulfur dioxide because I do not want the yeast, the still alive yeast, to be in the sulfur dioxide. At this point, we leave the temperature to increase naturally, and we rack everything to a previously blanketed tank again, and we discard only the heavy lease. As I said before, we found that it is very important to have less than, okay, no, we didn't say this. 
Um, we found that it's very important to have uh, less than 20 milligrams per liter of residual active ascorbic acid when adding yeasts if you want to ferment in barrels. This is because into the barrels we have a very complex chain of oxidative reductive reactions and uh, when the fermentation of malolactics terminate, and these reactions, these reactions are oxygen entering into the barrel, reductive tannins from the wood dissolving into the wine, reductive action of the lease. Ascorbic acid still in the wine will slow or just stop these chains, transforming the barrel from a reactor, that is the, why I love this kind of container, to a static container with just wood dissolvent, giving an annoying and a nose completely unconnected to the wine. When fermenting white wines in wood, we usually lower the temperature in the winery to keep temperature inside the barrel below 20 degrees. And when sugars are lower than two grams per liter, we inoculate bacteria for malolactic. From now and uh, until the end of malolactic, we operate a batonnage every 24, 45, 48 hours. So, uh, let's say that we make uh, something like three batonnage per week. To end malolactic or to interrupt it is a matter of style. Bacteria, after fermenting malic acid, attack citric acid, and this gives a significant production of diacetyl responsible for the battery nodes. I usually prefer to let the process go on till the end, having as a result a microbiological stable wine, not requesting sterile filtration before bottling. At this point, an addition of SO2 is essential. Target, check 20 milligrams of free, sulfur, uh, of free sulfur dioxide for all the aging period. Alessios, I'm just gonna have them pour the red wine so that we can keep going. They're gonna come around with spit buckets. If you have anything left in your glass, you can pour it out and we'll pour the red wine. Oh, so you want me to shift to the red process? Okay, thanks. <laughs> red wine. We missed a couple of slides that were very, very, very interesting, but it's okay. Friuli is quite a cold place, as you have seen. And usually our, our red wines will never be rich in body as the ones from Sicily and California. But these wines can be very elegant and soft. We usually have to deal with unripe fruit, harsh tannins, and problems in fixing the color. Someone dries the harvested grapes for some days before the stemming. But this always leads to international style. Wine that is rich in color, deep, large, and sweet wines, but they have no distinctive nose. It's not a technique I love. Having the target of excellent territorial wine, we had to adopt a soft maceration technique, and I usually prefer to talk about dissolution without moral implications instead of maceration because it gives the idea of what we have to do to bring into the wine the sweeter tannins and to keep the bad ones into the skin and into the seeds. And also, we needed to bring as much structure into the wine as possible. The combination we found to be the more suitable for this style was cold soak, low temperature fermentation, prolonged aging on the lease, and a very careful use of the wood. The way we do cold soak is quite simple, with the stem, and uh, at, the, at this point it's possible to add sulfur dioxide that can be considered a color extracting agent. It is possible to add enzymes to increase extraction, but uh, usually I do nothing. It's also possible to add uh, tannins to fix the color because we have no fermentation at this point. I spray everything with a dry ice to blanket, and everything is cooled in a cooling system at a temperature of seven degrees. And again, a consideration about soft pumps that are very, very important, especially in red wine making. Uh, so everything stays in the tank for at least three days and uh, I usually inject once or twice per day carbon dioxide to move the pumice. I've seen that uh, I have to use at least 20 liters per second injection to move uh, the pumice. The fourth day, the fourth day I start increasing the temperature to 20 degrees and uh, the day before I usually drain some hectoliters of clear mast to prepare a starter with selected yeasts. So when we reach the temperature of 20 degrees, we add the starter to the pomace, and I just use some CO2 to mix everything. Fermentation, day, day one is the same as day four of cold soak. The second day, I make a very short pumping over with a little bit of oxygen. Uh, I wrote max temperature 28 uh, uh, Celsius, but this is just for the very perfect ripe uh, bunches. Usually my peak is 25 degrees. 
The first day, I usually do a delestage with oxygen. At this point, I add again uh, the ammonium phosphate and complex nutrient. At this point, I refrigerate to at least 25 degrees, usually less than 23. The fourth day, another delestage, in this case without oxygen, because I like a little bit of reduction at this point, and I refrigerate it to 22 degrees. And uh, I try to keep this temperature for all the uh, wine making process. Okay, the Mosclapade is a blend. You, you need some explanations about Ribola, or you think it's a... Sure. Okay, Ribola is an indigenous varietal from Friuli. It's uh, absolutely not international wine. It's uh, the lightest wine of my winery. I call it my swimming pool wine, but it's uh, very fresh. The nose is uh, very nice. And uh, I used this wine here because it gives you the example of the, uh, a very clear example of the winemaking technique we use for this wine. A uh, big bodied wine like Chardonnay, for example, or Sauvignon Blanc was not so interesting to explain this style. What you are drinking now is a Monsclapade, that's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, a little percentage of Cabernet Franc and Merlot. And so it's a selection of the best grapes on uh, all of our lands, and it is aged for nearly two years in, uh, in wood. Okay, let's come again to the fermentation about red wines. I wrote that uh, from here, personal taste and style are the only um, parameters to check the correctness of extraction. It's a matter of style. Everyone decides for himself, I have no rules. I usually try to, so, to press and to rack when uh, I understand that, that we are going to extract our standings and I prefer to extract before having this sensation. At this point I press and I usually add what is pressed to the tank. I pump the wine into the barrels, discarding just the heavy lees uh, on the bottom. At this point, uh, we add uh, bacteria when sugars are less than two grams per liter, and if needed, nutrient for bacteria. As for the white wines, uh, batonnage every two days with a temperature of 20 degrees. When malolactic fermentation, this means when we have no malic and citric acids, uh, I usually wait for other 24, 10, 24 hours, I do the batonnage. I wait another day and I, I put everything into a tank, discarding the heavy lease. At this point, I add three grams of sulfur dioxide and I pump again the, um, the wine into the washed barrels. I do this to keep all the yeasts, all the still alive yeast in the wine and to discard only the heavy lease responsible for uh, reduction. As you have seen, style still aging is not considered in uh, my red wine making style. This is because I love wood and I think that wood really helps in developing the sweetness of the red wines. But of course, it's possible to make great red wines in stainless steel and it's also really, really easy to do malolactic in stainless steel tank instead of the barrels. But from my experience, in our variety, with our varietals and in our lands, we need the contribution of a little bit of wood to increase the soft and sweet sensations. How much new wood the period you will spend in wood, this is again a matter of style. Only two things in my mind are essential. The batonnage you do, because the story is the same as for the white wines. The yeasts dissolving into the wine give more body and more complexity, and uh, batonnage helps in uh, uniformating the oxidoreductive potential of the wine into the same container. And also uh, the sulfur dioxide level. We have seen that the traditional reaper system to estimate uh, sulfur dioxide does not work well with the colored tannic red wines. Because the tannins, being red active, are counted as uh, sulfur dioxide by this method, so the result will always be overestimated by at least 10 milligrams per liter. And we know that we need at least 20 milligrams of free sulfur dioxide to control oxidation and bretanomyces. A stupid page of conclusions. That is where I say that there are many possible conclusions. And uh, there is one I like more. We have the possibility, thanks to our soils, our commitment, science and technology, coupled with history, to make wine representative of our personality. A winemaking style should respect terroir and also should do marketing. It's important because at the end, the wine is in the bottle and the consumer just needs to uncork it to judge and have their opinion. Thanks.